Okay, uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for being here on time. Um, just make sure you're in the right room. Okay, so this is a demo lecture for the CFA Level 1 2024. My name is Jonathan Lau. Um, we've got a lot of people in the room and we also have some people online. Um, so welcome. Okay, so we have an hour. Um, actually, I have about probably 40 minutes or so, 40, 45 minutes. Okay, and then we'll have my colleague Leona who will finish up the, the last part of this uh, seminar about um, how you can sign up for our course, etc. Okay. Um, happy to take questions uh, during. Okay, if you have any questions um, to mine, just feel free to shout them out or throw your hand up if you want to. Uh, also, that applies to people online as well. So please just type in your questions if you have any. Um, I'll leave some time at the end as well for questions, okay, if you have any at the end as well. Okay, so what are we going to do today? I'm going to go through um, CFA. Okay, this is a little bit about myself. Okay, um, I was in uh, corporate finance. I was in asset management most of my career, and I've been training um, CFA and uh, banking programs for seven, eight years. Um, we can talk more about myself later if you want to. Okay, the agenda for today is as follows. Okay, so we're going to go through uh, the CFA program, what it is. Okay, is it uh, the right fit for you? Um, financial market trends, okay, a little bit. Okay, then we'll do a demo lecture, and, and the last part, as I mentioned, is my colleague, Leona, who's going to pick it up and go through Kaplan's offerings. Okay, so let's start. So, uh, who are the top employers of CFA charter holders? Okay, so these are just some large names, some large institutions, banks. Some of you told me that you work for banks. Um, of course, they employ lots of CFA charter holders, and we'll talk about what that means in a minute. Okay, so financial market players, this is just a very generic slide. Okay, some of you guys said uh, you want to move on to the buy side. Okay, meaning you want to be maybe portfolio managers, research analysts. Okay, great. It's very, um, you know, it's, uh, lots of people like to, to, to move to that side. Sell side, meaning the banks. Okay, but even with banks, lots of uh, different jobs there. Okay, someone told me they're a DCM. Someone told me they're in corporate finance or M&A advisory. And we have compliance as well. Of course, lots of, lots of different types of jobs. Um, okay, so this is just a, a very generic slide about what financial market players uh, are. Okay, now, what is the CFA program? So, there are other programs out in the, in the industry, okay, not just the CFA. There is um, Kaya, which is the alternatives exam. Kaplan also will provide courses for that. Um, there's FRM, Financial Risk Management. Okay, it's another, um, again, another program that uh, Kaplan will offer. Okay, but the CFA program is considered the gold standard in general financial, in the financial industry. Okay, it's a very broad-based exam. Okay, if you know anyone who has done it, or you guys may have done the exam already yourself, um, you'll know it's a hard exam. Okay, we'll go on to how hard it is in a minute. Okay, but people know how hard it is and people therefore regard it in, in high esteem. Okay, so who does it? People who want to move into finance. Who, who also does it? People who are already in finance. Okay, so it is, it is uh, well regarded. Okay, so you've got a lot of CFA charter holders, but there's a lot of people who do it. Okay, uh, we'll talk about what it, uh, how, how you actually have to, what exams you have to do in a second and... Uh, how to get the CFA charter holder in a minute. Okay, now, start with this. Um, who is able to do the exam in the first place? Okay, it's pretty broad-based, pretty uh, relaxed. If you are doing, uh, if you've got a degree, a US bachelor's degree, of course, a Hong Kong degree is fine as well. Um, if you are within 23 months of finishing your degree, okay, so if you're at the end of your first year, you can do the exam, okay? If you don't have a degree at all, but you've been working for full time, uh, full time for four years, then you can do the exam. Okay, so pretty much most people can do the exam. Okay, that's fine. Okay, so becoming a charter holder, what do you need to do? You need to pass all three levels of the exam. Okay, so we'll talk about that. Um, okay, now of course you've got to do level one first, pass that, then you can do level two. You can't jump to level two without passing level one first, of course. 
Uh, the limitations. Uh, you've got a limited number of tries now. Okay, actually, this used to, this has changed in the last year or two. Um, now, uh, if you fail to pass within six attempts of each level, then you're out. Okay, but six times per level, meaning you can almost do it, well, not quite, um, 15 times overall, five times each, right? You pass me your sixth time, you're okay. It's a lot of times. Okay, it's a lot of times that will take a long time to, to actually reach to. So, I mean, potentially possible, but, uh, but hard. Okay, fine. No time limit for completing the program. Okay, so you can pass level one, wait three years, pass level two, wait three years, pass level three. Okay, that's fine. Uh, no time limit for passing specific levels. Okay, so, okay. So, generally speaking, if you are really persistent, you can become a CFA charter holder. Okay, that's the, that's the bottom line. Okay, so you pass all three levels, then you need uh, relevant work experience. How much work experience? 4,000 hours. Okay, 4,000 hours, so divide by eight is 250. Uh, about two years of work experience is what they're saying. It used to say two years. Okay, now they've got it to 4,000 hours for some reason. Okay, and this is uh, in a minimum of 36 months accumulated before, during, or after the exam. Okay, so you have uh, a good amount of, of time to be able to gather that relevant uh, work experience. Um, meaning, okay, you can, you can take a break in a minimum of 36 hours, but not a maximum, 36 months, but not a maximum. Okay, so you could do uh, one year of relevant work experience and take a, uh, a couple of years break, into another relevant work experience, and then you can add those together. You've got 4,000 hours. You apply to do the CF, uh, for the CFA charter holder, and you can get your CFA charter holder. Now, what does relevant mean? Relevant means investment decision-making process, okay, in the investment decision-making process. Okay, so, so that's, that's key. That's important. Okay, so what happens is you've finished your three exams. You apply. They give you an application form. You, you fill it in. And then there'll be uh, what was your work experience, and you have to say exactly, you know, a few pointers on what they do. Okay, so um, if it's back office work in a bank, not investment decision making process. Okay, even middle office perhaps not. Depends how you describe it. Okay. Uh, now, in, in addition to that, two or three professional references. In other words, people who have the CFA vouch for you. Maybe your boss, maybe your colleague knows what you do. They they sign off for, on it. And then, and that, that's it. Okay. Then you pay your dues, and you're a re regular member of the CFA charter holder. You can put CFA at the end of your name on your business cards. Okay. Any questions on this slide? This slide's a bit cons bit full. Yes. Yep. Yep. So uh, it's just it before. You can do it before, you can do it during, you can do it after the exam. As, as I understand it, that, that's fine. Unless they've changed the rules very recently, I think that's fine. Yeah. Any other questions on this one? Come back to it later if you have any questions. Okay. <clears throat> now, uh, the three levels of the exams that we're doing. Okay, we're just focusing on level one first, of course, before we do level two and level three. Level one, the main problem is volume. There's a lot of stuff in level one. Okay, there's a lot of stuff in level two as well, actually. But let's focus on level one first. Um, lots of different uh, concepts we'll talk about. Okay, so we need time. Okay, that's uh, one of the key issues: is, is how much time do we have? How much time can we give up for this exam? Okay, we need time. That's the main battle. Okay, the area weights. Uh, there's 10 topics in uh, level one and level two, and here are again. You've got level three as well, but forget that. Just do, let's look at level one first, or, or first uh, before you pass that first. Okay, so you, it's very broad based. Okay, so you've got things like quantitative methods, which is stats. You've got economics. You've got financial statement analysis, which is accounting. Okay, so I heard that there's a few accountants in the room. Great, you'll have an advantage. Okay, so uh, but it's very broad based. Okay, lots of uh, lots of different topics, okay? Even if you're in finance or you've studied finance, I guarantee you there'll be areas that you definitely need to study. You can't just walk into the exam and pass it. Okay, of course it's helpful, but um, you do need to study. 
Now, of course, when you do come to do the exam, you're going to focus on the areas that are big. So you've got weightings here, the ranges, so accounting is important, equity and fixed income are particularly important, ethics is particularly important, and you've got some relatively small topics. Okay, So, of course, you're going to focus more of your time on the bigger weights um, than, than the smaller ones. Okay, but it's very um, broad-based. Okay, ten different topics. Okay, now, the exam itself. Um, it's been computer-based for a few years now, okay, before it used to be written. Okay, now it's all on computer. Okay, so level one, you can take four times a year. Level two, you can take three times. Level three, you can take twice a year in those months. Okay, so if we're here now doing this uh, seminar, then we're thinking about doing level, level one in uh, February, correct? February next, next year, okay? But you don't have to, okay? You can do this course and then take the exam in May. It's up to you, okay? But this course is designed for gearing people up to get ready to do level one in February 2024. Now, you might think, okay, well, if I do the exam in February and it's, it didn't go so well, that's okay, I'll just do it again in May. You cannot. Okay, you cannot take the adjacent exam window. Okay, you need to you basically give six months break, whether you pass or not. Okay, so if you uh, unfortunately fail the February exam, the next one you can do is August. Okay, is August. Okay, now this is the same thing in this next slide here. Okay, so let's say we take level one in February 2024. And like I said, if we fail it, we can retake it, of course, but we have to wait until August to retake it. Okay, now if we pass it, hooray. We can do level two. Now, there is a level two in May, but we can't do it. Okay, we will have to wait for six months. So August 2024 is the earliest time I could do level two. And then if I pass that, I can't do the, uh, sorry, I wouldn't be there, I'd be here. Um, and then I can do, can do the February, right? I can do the February. Okay, so if I pass August 2024 in level two, I could do level three in February 2025. Okay, so it, it could be very quick, could be very quick. I, I very highly, highly doubt it, to be honest. Okay, because even if you past uh, February 2024, when will they tell you that you've passed? Uh, probably sometime in April, June, April, May maybe. So, so you may not, you know, you don't know you've passed, so it's going to be hard to gear yourself up for level two, I would suggest. Okay, so this is all very compressed, it's, it's highly unlikely. Okay, so you know, give yourself some time to plan where you think you might be uh, in terms of taking this exam. Okay, so... Um, and the way it works is, uh, you know, if you sign up, has anyone signed up for the exam already? Hands up, anyone signed up for the exam? No one? Okay, great. Um, when, it, when you come to signing up for the exam, um, they'll give you like this week window and you, you choose a day that you want to do the exam, okay? And then you know, whatever best suits you. Okay? It used to be always on the Saturday and everyone would just, you know, flood into these exhibition centers. No longer, because now they need computers. Everyone needs a computer, so they can't do it that way. Okay, is that okay? Any questions on this slide? Good. Okay, um, now, the exam formats. All multiple choice questions, A, B, C, okay? You've got two uh, exams, uh, 90 questions each, two hours, 15 minutes per exam, so a total of four hours and 30 minutes. Okay, you have a break in between. Um, so it will start in the morning and you sort of be done by early afternoon or Okay, so it used to be three hours long each, and there used to be two of them again, uh, still two of them, but now they've reduced it two or three years ago. Okay, this is a problem. Pass papers unavailable. There's no pass papers available. Okay, that's, that's, uh, that's an issue. Okay, so you need to find some way of getting more questions. Okay, so you have questions in their books, in their curriculum, but you need more questions. Okay, so that's one thing. This is new. Practical skills module. Okay, this is new for this year. Okay, so for this, this year, meaning 2024. Okay, so this has never been in place before. Now, what does this mean? This is something they've put in um, after guidance or um, feedback from employers, where, they, where they've 
found that uh, CFA is very theoretical, but they'd like more practical skills to be part of the exam. Okay, so CFA level, level one now has, well, level two and level three as well, but level one uh, gives you, uh, you need to do something called the practical skills module, which is uh, 10 to 15 hours of uh, videos, um, practice questions, guidance, um, on a particular topic. Okay, in level one, there's two topics you can choose, Python uh, programming and financial modeling. Okay, those are the two choices. You can do both if you want to. So, so you have to do the practical skills module. It'll take you about 10 to 15 hours is what we've been told in order to get the results for your exam. So in other words, they're not graded. You are not graded on this but uh, you need to complete it, and then they will tell you your results for your exam. Okay? So if you don't do it um, by the, the time your exam results are ready, then they will give you another 90 days, uh, and then you have to do it. Okay? That's, um, that's, that's what we've been told. Okay, so that's new, that's interesting um, for this year, for, for, for uh, going forwards. And level two, they'll have other practical skills modules built, building on top of this, I believe. So they will, when you sign up for the exam, they will give you a link to the, the, mod, the videos to, to, to listen to and then do practice questions. And I, I assume, I'm not sure, maybe at the end of the, of the video, maybe there'll be like a Q&A, multiple choice, get 50%, and then you pass that module or something like that. I don't know. And that's what I imagine. I'm not sure. Okay, that I've got limited information because it's just released. Is that okay? Any other questions? That I can try and answer, but that's interesting. Okay, but it's not graded. Okay, so um, you know I could potentially help you with the financial modeling, the Python less so. Okay, my Python no good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the pass rates for the exam, global pass rates. Okay, so you've heard it's a hard exam. Presumably, it is a it's it's over COVID. Level one, let's just think of level one, so the light blue bars, it was at 22% at, at uh, pass rate. Okay, 100 people take it, 22 people pass it. Okay, it was super low. Okay, there were reasons for that they gave us. Uh, people apparently uh, were gearing up maybe to do it in the earlier, year, earlier months, earlier settings, and then they postponed it because of COVID, and then they didn't do enough work. Okay, and then they failed. Okay, that's, that's what we've been told. But anyway, so nowadays, anyway, uh, it seems to be back to normal. So high 30% is, is what it's been historically for like the past 10, 20 years. Okay, so high 30% is, is the pass rate. Okay, so it's a, it's a hard exam to pass generally. Okay, level two, level three, slightly better, but uh, let's focus on level one. Okay, so uh, evolution of the CFA program. So um, now, minimum time that they recommend for studying. Okay, this is what they target: three hundred hours per level, per level, not just uh, not not all three levels. Okay, so you're gonna have to find three hundred hours, and that's quite a good gauge. Okay, if you've spent three hundred hours studying for the CFA level one, and then you do the exam, you have good chance of passing. I would say. Okay, if you do way less than 300 hours, you know, your, your chances are not, a good, not as good, obviously. Okay, so here's the practical skills module element. Uh, you can choose financial modeling or Python. Okay, so that's level one. Okay, so as I mentioned, uh, volume is the battle, real battle. Okay, there are uh, these books, which we don't have here for some reason, not sure why, but... Um, uh, they are uh, 3,400 pages of, of, of just of the books, okay? So even just to read that material will take you uh, some time, okay? And then not just to read it, obviously, to understand it, digest it, be able to do questions on it. Okay, so that's a big problem. Okay, and this is something new as well this year. They've moved certain topics, certain subparts of these topics into prerequisite re readings, okay? So they won't ask you questions on those, uh, those parts per se, but they will expect you to understand that, that information, and then they'll build on it and ask you questions on the harder stuff. Okay, so this is uh, something that you'll need to self-study. Okay, so what is our approach? How are we going to tackle this? Okay, so here is our, uh, this is our um, 
our suggestion. Okay, our education phase will be 10 weeks of, of uh, walking you through the core concepts. Okay, which means you know 80% of the time going through the core concepts, the most important parts, maybe 20% of the time doing some questions. Okay, so um, now feel free to stand up and, uh, and pick these up if you like. But these, uh, this is the book, this is the curriculum. Okay, what we're saying is uh, 30 pages of the curriculum have been condensed to about 16 slides in, in let's say, one of the readings. Okay, so of course it's condensed. Okay, of course not all that information is within those 16 slides. Okay, but when we are going through the education phase, we're going through the core concepts. Okay, we're going through the most important stuff that is being tested. Okay, but not everything, unfortunately. Okay, uh, so but we're hoping, and you know, uh, if you understand the core concepts, then you have a good chance of passing. Okay, so that's the education phase. That's 10 weeks. Uh, my course would be Saturdays, six hours uh, each week, right? So start at 10, finish at five. Okay, after those 10 weeks of the education phase, then we've got the revision phase. So this is four and a half weeks, four and a half weeks of the revision phase. Okay, so here we are, we, we've understood some of the material, maybe not condensed everything, but we've gone through it at least. Okay, and now we're doing questions. Okay, now I give you time to do questions, and I debrief the questions. Okay, so we're just question drilling and doing trickier questions. Okay, and then the last part, if you want to do it, is a mock exam. Okay, so we'll give you two two-hour and fifteen-minute exams. Um, you do it. You do it online. Okay, as you would on the computer, as you would uh, in the real thing. Okay, and then I will uh, run through that in uh, one evening, so three hours, just to run through that exam. Okay, and that's the that is the course that we uh, we provide. Okay, so last part I'm going to do is run through a quick demo lecture. Okay, so just a few slides on um, alternatives is what we've picked. Okay, now one thing that we want to point out again, again, feel free to, to pick up the uh, slide packs afterwards later perhaps. Okay, so every single slide has on the top left a learning outcome statement and a number and a letter. Okay, so what that allows you to do is cross-reference it. Okay, you can go back and have a look at your... Um, at the curriculum, okay, or you can look at Schweizer. Okay, so we would suggest looking at Schweizer first. These are the books that you would get if you sign up for our courses as well, or you can buy them separately. Um, and of course, you've got the title. Okay, so anytime uh, you're not too sure about the various topics that we run through, then you can you can cross reference. Okay, let's have a look. Um, alternative investments is uh, is is what we're going to run through a few slides on. Okay, so the syllabus weight, you know, it changes every year. So now it's seven to ten percent. Okay, it's still a relatively small uh, topic, but it is um, bigger than it was. Okay, and many years ago it was four percent. Okay, so um, what are alternative investments? Firstly, okay, what are alternative investments? Okay, so versus. Traditional investments. Okay, so uh, what is a traditional investment? Anyone want to tell me what's a traditional investment? Give me an example of a traditional investment. There's a few. Deposit, like cash. Cash, I'll, I'll take cash. Okay, cash is one for sure. What else? Bonds. I thought you were going to give me bonds, but actually, since you're in the debt capital markets. <laughs> bonds or fixed interests. Corporate bonds, fixed interests. Or another name for the same thing. Okay, bonds. Great. What else? Big one. Equities, of course. Equities. Okay, so these equities or stocks. Okay, these would be my traditional investments. Okay, what everyone thinks of is it's just a name, right? But traditionally, this is what people might invest in. Let's say only. Okay, like 50 years ago, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, they just ch choose a portfolio between stocks, bonds, and and maybe some cash. Okay, now, what are alternative investments? A bit harder. What are alternative investments? If those are traditional investments. What are alternative investments? So it gives you some sort of 
idea here, but not really. So, options, potentially real estate, yes, I'll definitely take real estate. Real estate. Options, hmm. kind of. I guess the, there's another there's another field derivatives. Okay, derivatives will definitely be uh, options will definitely be under derivatives. Options is a derivative, um, but but yeah, and maybe maybe options is, is is one as well. Okay, basically anything that's not traditional investment is an alternative investment. Okay, real estate for sure. Okay, in Hong Kong we know what real estate is. Okay, so we've got a slide on each of our potential alternatives that we're going to just chat very briefly about. Okay, what other alternatives do we have? Okay, Hong Kong is obviously a big financial center. We have a lot of these types of alternative investments. What are they? Hedge funds, yeah, hedge, hedge funds. Hedge funds? Commodities? Take commodities. Private equity, fantastic. Okay, hedge funds, and I'm just gonna write PE, private equity. Okay, we've got a slide on each of these. Okay, here's a quick question. Hedge funds, what do they invest in? What do hedge funds invest in? Do they invest in equities? Do they invest in equities? Definitely, right? They, they invest in equities. They definitely invest in equities. Do they invest in bonds? They do. They can. I mean, not always, but they can, generally. Depend I mean, yeah. So they invest in equities. They invest in bonds. They can invest in cash. They can invest in all those traditional investments as well, right? So what makes a hedge fund different to a traditional investment? Regardless of... Rega okay, regardless of the state of the economy is good or bad. Perfect smile. Um, not sure what you mean by that, sorry. Could you tell me more? They can show. Okay, okay, yeah, no, that's great. No, the equi hedge funds can short. Okay, that's a big one. Okay, what does short mean? What does short mean? Yes. Yes, thank you. Very good, very good, very good. So they can short, hedge funds can short, meaning when equities go down, they can make money. Let's just keep it simple for now, okay? <laughs> they can make money. By, so so what, what do these traditional equity funds do? These, you think of like your pension funds, your mutual funds, they are typically called long only, okay? So some terminology, meaning when the markets go up, they go up, okay? So how about when... Uh, if a pension fund invests and they think, oh, next, next month they're very sure, uh, the, the market's going to go down by 50%, they're very, very sure, so what are they going to do? What can they do? Well, they, if they're long only, they can move into cash. They can sell 50% or, you know, that's probably quite a big move for them. Okay, so 50% in cash, 50% in equities, and then the, the market crashes and they're very happy because they've only lost half their money, or they've only got half their money exposed to the market. Okay, but they've still gone down. Okay. But hedge funds, what could they do? They can short. So therefore, when the market crap uh, goes down, they can they can make money. Okay, they can actually um, you know, um, use things like options. Someone mentioned. Okay, for for an example. Okay, and they can they can win when when markets go down. Okay, so that's some, that's something they can do. Okay, so alternatives, uh, hedge funds, private equity, we'll talk about real estate, commodities. Okay, so all these different types of things are, are examples of, of alternatives. Okay, so um, what are they? They typically have higher fees. 
Okay, so hedge funds, private equity, you might have heard of 2 and 20. Okay, it's just some uh, terminology again where they say 2% is their annual management fee, annual management fee, and then 20% is their performance fee. Okay, so they get lots of money when they, when they make money. Okay, uh, private equity is similar. Okay, so they tend to have higher fees, tend to be less liquid. Okay, we'll talk about that. Uh, they tend to be less regulated. Okay, th they can do all kinds of things. Okay, so let's have a look. Okay, so here we go. Uh, categories we've talked about, hedge funds, private equity. Okay, these are the key ones, I would say, in level one. Okay, a bit about real estate. Of course, in Hong Kong, we know what real estate is. Commodities, meaning gold or oil. I take a position on, on, on I, th I think I know which direction the price of oil is going. Then I go and buy or sell it. Other things, infrastructure, collectibles, patents, lots of things. Anything that's not a traditional investment is an alternative. It's a big area. Okay, that's why Kaya has an entire exam on it. Okay, so but for CFA, it's just one of the 10 topics. Okay, so, um, why would we want to invest in alternatives? Okay, why do we want to invest? Okay, um, Potentially, diversification benefits. Okay, so I have a load of money. I want to invest in equities and bonds and cash, but, but how about other things? Okay, how about hedge funds? How about private equity? And why would I do that? Because uh, they may be less correlated uh, with traditional investments. Okay, so hopefully this hedge fund is doing things the right way. And when markets go down, all my equities are going down, but I've got my hedge fund that's going up. Okay, potentially it's possible. Okay, so uh, diversification benefits. You know, if you if you have not everything going the same direction, then then you are you that's that's good for you. Also, what else? High returns potentially again. Okay, why are you paying them two and twenty percent? That these massive fees, uh, because you're hoping that oh, some of them at least uh, you know are doing have done very well. Maybe they're going up fifty percent last year. You know that kind of thing. Okay, now uh, a couple of things to be aware of. Uh, you know, when you go and look, let's say you go and look at a magazine, Hedge Fund Monthly, I don't know, yeah, what some of these hedge fund magazines, and there's like this table, this index return that says, okay, hedge funds last year, it did 25%. And it's like, fantastic, we should all invest in hedge funds then, shouldn't we? Okay, there are things that bias these numbers upwards, okay, from these tables, okay? So one of them is survivorship bias. Okay, what does that mean? That means the hedge funds that you saw last year that was making those 25% returns, um, they're all the successful ones. They're the ones that have survived. Okay, let's say 10 years ago you went and invested in hedge funds or some generic hedge fund index. Um, you know, all those hedge funds afterwards died. Okay, and they won't be in that last year that had such good returns. Okay, so it's that survivorship bias. Okay, people, uh, you don't see the ones that have already collapsed. Okay, and backfill bias is something similar. Okay. So hedge funds, we talked about already a little bit. Okay, what can hedge funds do? Hedge funds can do have all the tools in the toolbox. Okay, they can short, they can use derivatives such as options. Okay, and they can use leverage. In other words, they can borrow money, and uh, and and make some like um, they can like for example arbitrage. Maybe there's some money to be made, but not very much. Maybe it's just a few percent. It's not really uh, enough with fees, etc., it's not, not really worth a lot of players going there. But hedge funds might be able to lever up, go and borrow money from the bank and make, make more returns from this small uh, price difference. Okay, so which means hedge funds are quite risky investments generally, okay, quite risky. So they are limited to qualified investors. Okay, you can't just be anyone to invest in hedge funds. Okay, firstly, you need to have a certain size. Okay, if you are below... Well, it depends on the hedge fund, but usually at least a million USD uh, in, dis in just disposable assets, which means not including your house, uh, then you would not be uh, eligible to even invest in hedge funds. Okay, they don't want small tickets, they don't want small sizes. Okay, so it's not for your for your widows and orphans. Okay, so we said illiquidity is a problem with alternatives. Um, here's an example. So uh, lock up period. Minimum time before the investor can withdraw the funds. Okay, so a hedge fund launches. Some star fund manager comes out and says, okay, I'm launching a new fund. Uh, everyone wants to give them money. Okay, and then they take the money. Thank you very much. And then they say, but there's a lockup period. Okay, so there's like uh, one year 
you cannot take your money back. Lock up period, okay? After that one year, you can. But even after that one year, there's a notice period. Always with hedge funds, there's always a notice period. Okay, so maybe it's uh, quarterly. Maybe it's monthly. Okay, so uh, they, they restrict your access. It's not like you can get your money out next day. Okay, usually mutual funds are better. Long only funds are better than that. Okay, they, they, they lock you in. Um, what's the reason why they lock you in? Why do they lock you in to these uh, to these investment strategies? Yeah. Yeah, but why? Yeah. Okay, so uh, sure, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, so let's say maybe they have invested in a small cap. A company. Okay, maybe they own 30% of this uh, relatively smaller sized uh, share. So if they were to have to, to exit out of that position, then and they had to do it the next day, then um, then the price would tank. Okay, but if they are given in like maybe three months to gradually get out of it, then maybe they, the price impact won't be as big. For example, okay, so it allows them. They would argue to invest in sort of illiquid uh, positions more easily. Okay, it's, it's just one example. Okay, so they're a little bit illiquid. Okay, what else? Private equity. Okay, so private equity, people think of private equity as um, <coughs> investing in small companies. Okay, that's what generally people think of as private equity. Okay, so you want to invest in uh, the next Facebook, the next Meta, or Uber, or wh whichever company that's not listed yet. Okay, so you, you're listing in a private company. Okay, what does a private company mean? What does a private company mean? Not listed, right? Not listed. Okay, what, is, what does that mean? Not listed, meaning it's not on the public uh, exchange, okay? Like the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. It's not on there. It's not one of the names that is trading, you see it going up and going down. It's private. You know, if I launch a company tomorrow with my with much limited money I have, okay, then, then that's a private company. No one can see the price going up or down because it's just me or a few people. Okay, then it's private. But once you've listed it, then it's public. Okay, so we're talking about private com investing in private companies or taking public companies private. So they are public and I take them private. That's private equity as well. Okay, so they're private equity. And then what do I do? Then I, I um, so... Either I invest in these small stage companies, right? So Mark Zuckerberg, after he's, uh, he's just set up uh, Facebook after a couple of years, he's still working in a WeWork office, and he's just got, you know, 50 people. I invest in his company. Okay, it's private. And then what am I hoping? I'm hoping to, you know, maybe buy 10% from him, and then in five years' time, they IPO, and I make lots of money. Okay, that's private equity. Well, that's venture capital, actually. Okay, that's venture capital. Okay, there's another one. There's another private equity strategy, which people think of less, I think, called uh, levered buyouts, leveraged buyouts, LBOs. Okay, what is that? That is taking public companies, generally, not always, using leverage to buy as much of that company, uh, to buy the company out, but using as much borrowing the, from, the, from whoever lends me money, from the banks, issuing bonds, just borrowing as much money as they can, buying that company, restructuring it, and then after three or five years, selling it. Okay, a little bit more complicated, a little bit more complicated. Okay, venture capital is what people think of more in terms of private equity. Okay, and we've got a couple of other things that are sort of less important, certainly for the exam. Okay, what else? Real estate. Real estate in Hong Kong. Okay, so straightforward, right? Residential, where I live. Commercial property, offices, okay, so I could invest if I have enough money and I go and buy an office, okay, and I go and let it out to a big insurance company, okay, great. Okay, but if I don't have the money to go out and buy a property myself, what can I do? I could go and invest, get access to, uh, to real estate through a fund, okay, one such fund is a real estate investment trust, okay, REITs. What are these? These are funds that are listed on the stock exchange. They are public. Okay, so I can go and buy these shares in these companies, and I will uh, I will have my exposure to the uh, to the shopping malls or offices or whatever. Okay, 
Um, mortgages, mortgage-backed securities, okay, is a big part of uh, fixed income as well. Okay, and that's another way to access real estate. Um, farmland, timberland, okay, so all these different kinds of real estate. Now, one thing with, let's say, buying a, uh, an office block is um, I actually have some inflation protection here. Okay, why do I have some inflation protection if I buy an office block? Because what am I doing? I'm renting it out to an insurance company, let's say. They pay me rent every year. And if there's inflation of 10%, next year, what can I do? Increase my rent. Okay, I can ask them, sorry, inflation is 10%. Your rent has gone up to 12%. And they accept it or they don't accept it. Okay, but uh, I have that option. Okay, so a bit of inflation protection with real estate. Okay, lastly then, commodities. Okay, so if I have uh, an opinion on the gold price or the oil price or the wheat price, whatever commodity you like, okay, how do I, uh, how do I access that? I could, let's say oil, I could go and buy 10,000 barrels of oil, get exposure to commodities that way, hold it for a year and sell it. Okay, I could do that. Okay, but it's a bit of a pain because I've got to go and fit that 10,000 barrels somewhere. Right, I've got to go and store it. Okay, it's actually going to cost me money. I need to go and probably buy an oil tank or rent it. Okay, so that's troublesome. Okay, so most exposure for commodities will be gained through derivatives, okay, through contracts, through some kind of financial instrument that will give me access uh, to, the, to the price. Okay, so that's, that's most common. Now, with commodities, the return is going to come entirely from the price change. Okay, so I buy the oil at $50, and I hope to sell it for more, $52, $60, whatever. In other words, I don't get any income. You know, I potentially might even have to pay for storage costs, like I said. Okay, so I really have to be correct with the, the price. If it's going up or down, um, I'm not getting paid to wait. Okay, if I invest in bonds, I get interest. If I invest in stocks, I get dividends. Okay, so I do get paid, okay, but not with commodities. Okay, so even riskier. Okay, even riskier. Potentially, I could hedge uh, inflation risk through commodities. It depends. Okay, so if I buy oil and there's an oil price shock, then yes, it can help, but it might not be an oil price shock, in which case it may not help. Okay, so that is uh, alternatives very, very quickly. A couple of quick uh, questions. Which of the following best describes one of the potential benefits of alternative investments? Uh, benefits of alternative investments. Reduction in portfolio risk, liquidity, or transparency. What are one of the benefits? Who thinks it's reduction in portfolio risk? Who thinks it's liquidity? Who thinks it's transparency? Okay, so answer is A, reduction in portfolio risk. Why? Because of diversification, okay, which is what we said. Okay, certainly not liquidity because, uh, you know, we've, we've got those, uh, we said with hedge funds, they've got the uh, limits on how much you can take back and the notice periods. Transparency as well. Okay, hedge funds tend to be quite secretive in what they invest in. Okay, they don't tell them to tell everyone unless, well, because they, they want to, you know, they don't want other people knowing generally. All right, question two. An investor is looking for a hedge against inflation. The investment most likely to achieve the investor's goals is farmland, hedge funds, or private equity. Investors looking for a hedge against inflation. The investment most likely to achieve the investor's goals is farmland, hedge funds, or private equity. Who thinks the answer is A? Who thinks the answer is B? C? Not sure. Okay, answer is A. Why A? A is property. Property, commercial property, we said, but farmland also property, all right? So I'm renting it to someone. If there's inflation, I can increase the rent. Okay, that's the, that's the key. A lot of people might say hedge funds, right? Hedge, hedge funds, that'll be the, the, 
the trick answer. And it's potentially possible that it's correct, but it's not the best answer. Okay, if, if a hedge fund's objectives, and there'll be lots, you know, it's just like a fund, any fund can have different objectives. If the fund's objective is inflation plus 2%, then, you know, of course, they will be investing in inflation links, but, but that's not the best answer. Okay, so um, that wraps up my session.